All right, hello everybody, uh, and welcome. It is an absolute pleasure today to get to introduce Dr. Lucas Garibaldi uh, on behalf of the Planetary Health Alliance and the Center for the Environment. Um, Lucas is joining us from the National University of Rio Negro in Bariloche, Argentina, um, where he is a professor and a director of the Research Institute of Natural Resources, Agroecology, and Rural Development, uh, as well as being a member of the National Science Research Council of Argentina. Uh, and for me, I'm particularly excited that Lucas has joined us, I should note, after not one, not two, but three flights. So thank you, Lucas, for, <laughs> for joining us. Um, I'm really excited because his work addresses really central questions at the interface of food systems, biodiversity, and human well-being. Uh, his research has been absolutely foundational for our understanding of the role animal pollinators, such as bees, butterflies, and birds, play in supporting crop yields across the globe. Um, and since about a third of food crops depend on these pollinators, uh, Lucas's work is not only fascinating, but it's really critically important for tackling the challenges of sustainably producing food on a crowded and transforming planet. Um, in addition to his talents as a research ecologist, Lucas's work stands out to me because he thinks so deeply about the place of humans in the landscape, um, seeking to understand not only the consequences of environmental change, but also the social, economic, and health benefits that we derive from biodiversity. Lucas is also a leader in developing practical policy solutions, including, this is uh, to me amazing, personally drafting laws uh, that Argentina is working on for uh, uh, pollinator conservation. And he's also the coordinating lead author of the FAO's Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Report on Nature's Contributions to People. That is a mouthful. <laughs> but, um, and that is among many, 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 I promise you check out his website, many other <laughs> incredible accomplishments. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucas. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so today I will talk about uh, conventional intensification, which has been the main process of agriculture during the past decades. And it is based on large holdings created homogeneous landscape and an increasing use of agricultural inputs like fertilizers, pesticides, and hives. And conventional intensification through the decades have been increasing crop yield. Crop yield is the amount of crop output that we obtain per hectare. And this is based in part through the increasing use of agricultural inputs that provide resources to crops. Uh, but uh, this um, main uh, um, way to do agriculture has also many costs and among them a well-recognized cost is the biodiversity loss. So the idea is how to change this into how to instead of more crop yield meaning less biodiversity how we can promote biodiversity and the associated ecosystem services like nutrient cycling, pest control, and wild pollination to replace, complement, and interact synergistically with agricultural inputs. And we call this ecological intensification in contrast to conventional intensification, and in this way to improve crop yield. Through, so from a desk, everybody agree with this. It's a very nice idea, so uh, politicians like it, uh, farmers like it, everybody like it. But uh, there is not much uh, data in terms of uh, when you go out to the field and you talk with the farmers, so they say, okay, how much biodiversity do I need? How much semi-natural areas, some how much natural areas do I need to preserve and how much crop yield I am going to obtain. Uh, I need two hectares, how is the spatial configuration of that natural areas. So this is a knowledge gap and in our group we are trying to provide the data behind these ideas on how to implement these ideas in real 
world landscapes. So, so my talk actually is about uh, ecological principles for sustainable crop production. It could be also a science-based policies for sustainable crop production or actions for sustainable crop, produ crop production. So I will talk about eight uh, policies or actions that uh, they are based on scientific evidence for increase crop production in a sustainable way based of course on pollination studies. It's not going to be a random search of the literature, it's going to be biased to our work because <laughs> the idea is to show you the work that we have been doing. There are a lot of other nice examples in the, in the literature. So in this talk I I'm going to use uh, pollen as a resource influencing crop yield and pollen can be provided uh, from wild pollinators as an ecosystem services or from managed pollinators like honeybees in hives as an agricultural input. <clears throat> so in the same way that uh, through conventional intensification we create uh, large monocultures, uh, we have the same approach to pollination uh, with only one species uh, in large quantities. So one of the questions that we asked was, is this enough uh, from a productive point of view? So uh, if you don't care about conservation issues uh, and you are only uh, worried about uh, agricultural aspect and crop yield, so is this type of management enough to obtain high pollination, high crop yield, or do we need biodiversity and wild biota? <clears throat> so we, we did a synthesis of different studies in different places and around the world. So in each of these places, we have many fields. And we, in each place, we kind of contrast or try to have four situations, one situation with lot of honeybees and lot of wild insects, another situation with lot of honeybees and uh, low abundance of wild insects, and another situation with lot of wild insects and little honeybees, and another situation with no honeybees and no wild insects. And by trying to contrast those situations within the same crop system, we in an observational type of study, we try to understand the relative roles of honeybees and wild insects to crop pollination and crop yield and try to understand if uh, honeybees could replace the role of wild insects and or if they were enough for crop pollination. So this is a synthesis of all the studies. Here we have honeybees, here we have wild insects. This is a, in a per visit basis so zero means that on average one visit of the honeybees do not deposit pollen. Negative, it means the pollen thief. And positive, it means that they deposit more pollen on stigmas that, uh, <coughs> that they take away. So you can see that on a per visit basis, honeybees deposit much more pollen on, on the stigmas of the flowers than the wild insects. But then these pollen need to germinate and produce uh, fruits and seeds. And when you do the same analysis for fruit, on a per visit basis, wild insects produce more fruits than honeybees. So honeybees deposit a lot of pollen, but that pollens do not transform so efficiently into fruits. Wild, ins wild insects on average deposit less pollen but that pollen, it translates more efficiently into fruit. So when you do the, the same analysis, instead of working kind of a general synthesis across all the crops, when you look at uh, fruits for each individual crop that we work with, here you can see almond, buckwheat, cotton, cherry, 
and this is only for honeybees. This is why the the color in yellow, and we have Ronaldinho here. And you can see that uh, on average the effect is positive, but uh, the degree of honeybee contribution varies a lot to the different crops. And for some crops, you can see that it overlaps a lot with zero, so the, the role of honeybees as pollinators is uh, unquestioned. And if you do the same analysis for the wild insects, uh, so the, the results are very clear that uh, a, a community of wild insects are contributing positively to all the crops and the degree of variability in the results are much less. So it's very clear that Messi is much more efficient than <laughs> <laughs> Ronaldinho. So, <laughs> so, not many Brazilians here? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh, but so far, uh, uh, we demonstrate that uh, on a per visit basis, uh, wild insects are more efficient than honeybees, but still you can put a lot of honeybees and you can compensate with abundance the less efficient of uh, honeybees. So the idea is that uh, wild insects might have a role, but only in those places where there are not so many honeybees. But in those places where you have a lot of honeybees, wild insects are not going to be so necessary. If that is true, statistically you're going to expect a negative interaction between the role of honeybees and wild insects. And what we find is that in terms of pollen and fruits there is no interaction. So uh, that means that uh, they are doing, uh, they complement each other. So to obtain maximum pollination and fruit set you need both uh, honeybees and wild insects. So the <laughs> The, the best pollination team, it has both uh, honeybees and wild insects to obtain a high, high pollination, high fruit set. So if we summarize everything that I said in a graph, you have visitation rate here, crop yield here. So more honeybees only, it means more crop yield. Uh, more wild insects, in, it means more crop yield at a higher rate because they are more efficient, but when you have both is the best situation in terms of crop yield. Uh, what we have found is that if you have too many honeybees, it can be even negative from the crop. And this is uh, in a study under review, and this is the, the effect of visitation rate of fruit set and this is the effect of visitation rate only in both cases of honeybees on seed sets. So in terms of fruits and seeds, too many honeybees might be uh, not so good even. So, so it's not only that this curve saturate, but uh, uh, too many hon honeybees, it can be even negative for the, for the crop. Uh, so we can discuss later why um, one species cannot replace a, a community of insects, but uh, one of the reasons is summarized in this gra graph, and you can see here that uh, more species, in terms of numbers of species, across the world, so each point is uh, it's a field in one place in the world. There are 600 points here, more or less. It's highly associated with the richness of traits in terms of the functions they perform in the crop in terms of pollination and also how they react differently to, to weather and environmental conditions. So species richness is highly correlated with functional richness. Uh, and and we, we can discuss m more about this, but in short, we, we are, honeybees are great. <laughs> uh, it's just we are asking too much to only one species. So, so we have 
uh, many different species of crops, each one with unique uh, life history traits in different places of the world. And we want only one species to be the best pollinator for all the crops under all circumstances, in all the weather of the world and in different, under different management conditions. So it's, it's too much. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, um, this is one example in terms of that uh, the, the things that ecosystem services are providing, even if we focus on single ecosystem services like pollination, pest control, or natural recycling, are not uh, fully replaced with agricultural inputs like. Uh, fertilizer, pesticides, or hives. So this was the, the first principle or the, fir the first policy to promote diversity, species diversity or organism diversity in general. The second principle is to enhance uh, natural habitats within uh, agricultural landscapes. So <clears throat> usually conventional intensification as I said at, at the beginning of my talk, create homogeneous landscape at the expense of natural habitats. This is a photo in, in North Argentina. Um, <clears throat> and this is an issue that uh, it's very important at the global scale. So here you can see the area covered with cropland and the area covered with pastures and rangeland, and together they are a little bit more than 40% of the terrestrial land. So uh, farmers and agronomists, uh, they are managing uh, all the work and the decision they take are very important for our livelihood, not only in terms of the food that we get, but in terms of everything, air, water, uh, soil erosion, etc. The rest of the land is, and these are the best lands of the world because the rest of the land is covered by cities and uh, also by desert and is not uh, very productive. So this is a huge problem at the global scale. So especially some people when we come from Argentina, from the US, we we do have some national parks and we do have some national environments, but uh, actually the planet is already too small for us and we live in, it's, our planet is like a huge farm uh, that uh, is mostly managed for our animals and our crops and our forest. Uh, forestry is another big issue. So, <clears throat> Uh, the idea is how this uh, reduction in natural habitat is affecting pollinators, then pollen deposition and to crop production. And we did these studies in different places on the world. And this is kind of a summary that we are finding that in many different places in the world, the reduction of natural habitats in agricultural landscape reduce the diversity of pollinators and this reduction of the diversity of pollinators is affecting uh, how much pollen there are in the forest but also the temporal and the spatial stability in the pollen and is reducing the rate of increase in yield. Crop yield of course not only depend of, on pollinators and crop yield is increasing for most crops all over the world because we have uh, better varieties, we use more agrochemicals, we are improving our agricultural techniques, but this crop yield is increasing at a lower rate uh, for crops that depend more on pollinators and because of pollinators poll and pollination deficit. So these crops are uh, increasing their yield at a lower rate, but society demands a crop production. So 
to achieve the same crop production that society demands at increasing levels, these crops compensate with more agricultural area and more agricultural area at the expense of other land uses, usually natural habitats. So this is a negative cycle where a more agricultural area means less natural habitat, less pollinator diversity, less pollen, less crop yield, then you need more agricultural area. So the idea is how to transform this negative cycle into a positive cycle. Uh, so the idea is to perform <coughs> pollinator friendly practices that would be an example of ecological intensification. As I told you before, ecological intensification is based in promoting biodiversity and associated ecosystem services and to increase crop yield through these ecosystem services. So the idea is that pollinator friendly practices uh, modify the environment to provide flower and nested resources to the pollinators so in that way they provide more biodiversity of pollinators then more pollen and then more crop production. These practices can be within the crop itself but they can also be outside the crop and, <clears throat> and of course one of the practices outside the crop is uh, promoting natural habitats but it's also important to uh, promote habitat diversity of habitat heterogeneity. And in this sense, for example, this is a, <coughs> a landscape uh, in California, in the US, and these are results from Claire's Kremen lab. And here, uh, tomatoes are going to be grown and these are almonds and this is the same place five years later and you see that only a small piece of land was used and this land was plumbed just for cultural reasons because you're not going to obtain much harvest here so instead of expending money in that so in this small piece of land they grow uh, plants that provide flower resources and nesting resources for pollinators and from here these pollinators uh, provide pollination to the apples, orchards and also to the tomatoes. Uh, there are many examples of pollinator friendly practices uh, that uh, they are based in the ideas that you need plant diversity to provide resources through th the whole season that pollinators are active. They're also based in providing uh, plants that are native to the places and many other ideas and they be also benefit pollinators because they increase habitat diversity and we can discuss more about these practices later. But an important thing to take into account and is is that the effectiveness of these practices, of course, they vary for different places and different crops in different places of the world, in the same way that you're not going to apply the same amount of fertilizer for all the crops in all the places of the world. Uh, these practices also vary with the environmental and management conditions. And this is an example of it. So, uh, this is in South Africa, so you have a comparison of these, of two types of sunflowers. Uh, in the lower part, you, this is the sunflowers that uh, uh, most farmers want to show you. You can see here that this crop is clean, so no weeds. And we compare these uh, farms with some farms where some a small amount of weeds were left there. And these are plant pollinator networks. So in the lower part you have the plants and you see here that uh, it most, it's mostly sunflower because it is a sunflower crop. And up here you see that it's sunflower and a small abundance of different weed species. Uh, and 
here you have the pollinators and you see that uh, where you have no weeds you have only honeybees but in the other farms you have a, a richer network of plant pollinators because you have honeybees but you have a lot of other species of pollinators and these species they are being attracted by the weeds but they also visit the sunflower so the living a, a small amount of weeds saves money because you save agrochemicals and also attract pollinators to the sunflowers. And these were farms that were far away from natural habitats. Now it's the same situation but uh, increasing distance to natural habitats. So these farms were close to natural habitats. And if you focus only on the lower part you see that if you use a lot of agrochemicals and you have no weeds, if you are close to natural habitats, you are going to benefit from the natural habitats. Uh, and the difference between living a small amount of weeds is lower uh, if you are close to natural habitats than you, if you are far away from natural habitats. So the effectiveness of this practice, that is a local practice, it also depends on the landscape, of how you manage the landscape. So there are a lot of interactions between pollinator-friendly practices and the amount of, the magnitude of the effect that you obtain uh, is going to vary with the, the environmental conditions and this is the kind of uh, concrete applied knowledge that we are trying to, to develop and to gather. And here, you see the effects on the seeds. So you see here that when you are far away from natural areas, the number of species of wild plants or weeds, uh, it has a positive effect on the sunflower harvest. So it, it's not that the weeds benefited the visitation on the, or, and the pollination. They also benefit the harvest. So it was good for the pockets, it was good for money and income. And you see that when you get closer to the natural areas, uh, the benefits of the weeds decrease because you already had the benefit of the natural habitat. And of course, the best farms were those close to natural habitats because you see you have the highest uh, harvest of seeds. So when we summarize the different studies and we see uh, we also take into account how far the pollinators move from the natural areas and from the different uh, <clears throat> practices that we implement uh, or habitat that we implement to promote the uh, pollinators. We see that the, this habitat for pollinators need to be as maximum 200 meters away from the crop. So for some places that are heterogeneous, this is not a problem, like in Europe, but uh, other places, like uh, in some places of the US or in Argentina, we have huge monocultures, so this uh, 200 meters is 20 hectares. So, uh, I don't know how many acres, but... <laughs> uh, so this means uh, putting this into space is also a, a very important thing and, and it means also a, a change in, in some places in the way that we are doing currently agriculture. So, so far we have seen uh, some examples of uh, ecological intensification through the lens of pollinator friendly practices and how they can be important in terms of crop yield. This is only from an agricultural point of view and how they can increase crop yield. And the next step, if these practices hold for different type of agricultural system, for a small or large holdings. So this is very important because uh, around the world there are many challenges that are related to agriculture and farming system. Um, to mention three important of them is poverty and malnutrition, increasing demands, so each year society demands more agricultural production, not necessary food. So 
from agriculture we obtain a lot of products that are not necessarily contributing to our food security but they are economic goods and services but we need to do this in sustainable ways uh, in both environmental and social sustainable ways and there are some <coughs> estimate that they are quite shocking in, in the ways that we need how much uh, uh, agricultural production needs to be increased in the next 40 years so uh, some estimate goes from 70 percent to uh, say that we need to double agricultural production so this is a huge uh, worldwide issue in terms of uh, food security and in terms of this uh, challenge uh, small holdings are very important and there are many different ways to the uh, define small holdings but uh, a common accept definition is uh, farmers than farm less than two hectares and it's important because uh, around two billion people are reliant on small holding agriculture this is more or less one fourth of the global population and two billion people is around 83 percent of the global agricultural population and these people live mostly in developing nations and here is where a uh, human population is growing faster than in developed nations here is where people is poor and here is where people is undernourished and here is where you need to provide local solutions so if we increase uh, two percent the crop yield of soybeans in argentina or two percent the crop yield of corn in the u.s and in argentina that is not necessarily related with food security in poor places because that corn probably goes to biofuel or if you cannot pay it it's not going to reach these places so uh, the paradox is that uh, most people that uh, is food unsecure they are also food producers and they don't have much money to go into market so so you need to provide local solutions and so we were very serious and worried about this and we have seen that most of the evidence about the little evidence about ecological intensification and pollinator friendly practices come from developed countries so we wanted to provide uh, knowledge and data on real farms in developing countries so you see the point here that these are mostly in developing countries and we wanted to work with real farmers and we so we work with during five years uh, in each of these places under a common protocol and you have seen here we have Norway it is a developed country but they they work with us the last two years and they finance the last two years of the whole project so they wanted to apply also the same protocol so of course they were most welcome <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we work in 33 crop system and many fields in each of this system and here we apply the same protocol in small holdings but also in large holdings the interesting things in these developing countries is that you have many different th systems and there is also a conversion from sometimes traditional small holding system into more conventional, conventional large holding systems. So, so it was very interesting to know if this uh, pollinator friendly practices apply to different type of, of, of farming systems. So what we did here is to compare in each system a different farms that were applying different pollinator friendly practices um, so we in each region we try to hold a, into the same crop variety the same management techniques but everything constant except the uh, pollinator practices so we try to create contrast in uh, pollinator abundance and diversity um, so <clears throat> we work with the 
real farmers in real farm because we wanted this knowledge to be applied. So we used the pollinator friendly practices that were already uh, being used in these landscapes. And in terms of food security, uh, for increasing crop production, you can increase the potential crop yield, that is the amount of crop that you harvest in the best farms, or you can also try to reduce the yield gap. And this is the, when you go to a region, despite, uh, for example, you have many farmers growing sunflowers, these different farmers are not harvesting the same yield. So if you can uh, do that, uh, the farmer that has lower yield to uh, reach the higher yields, that is reducing the yield gap between the farmers with the lower yields uh, uh, to the higher yields, and you can increase crop production to a high degree in that way. So the yield gap is different in yield between high and low yielding farms of a given region. And why some farmers harvest less yield? Well, because they maybe they fertilize, they use less fertilizer, or the <coughs> the irrigation system they use is not so good, etc. But one of the reasons could be because they have higher pollination deficit. And why we think that pollination deficit could be important in terms of the yield gap. And this is because uh, management for improved pollination services isn't common all over the world. And so here in the US is probably the best example of uh, a, a pollination a market, especially in California, but uh, for almonds, but uh, this is not a common situation all over the world. And still here, with almonds, you have a lot of pollination deficit problems. So it's not common that farmers manage for crop pollination. And when they do, they don't do it so well as with the other issues like uh, pest control or uh, nitrogen cycling. And it has also been neglected in the studies analyzing the continental or global drivers of yield gaps. So yield gaps is a very important issue in terms of how are we going to meet this challenge of increasing uh, crop production. And there are many famous studies in science and nature analyzing the drivers of yield gap. None of them focus on pollination deficits. So uh, if farmers are not focusing on pollination and scientists are not focused on pollination, so if you control everything, you have a uh, good genetic, good uh, fertilize or nutrient management, good uh, pest management. And if you lack like pollinators, pollinators can be even more important than before. Um, <clears throat> so in the different areas of the world that we work, if you compare the low yielding farms with the high yielding farms, there is a yield gap of almost 50%, and this is a lot. And we are not using the ext extremes, the minimum and maximum here. Uh, so we are using the 10 percentile and then 90 percentile, so not to be biased by the best or the poor, poorest farmers. And if you do the same for the <coughs> pollinators, you have also almost a 50% yield density gap that is uh, the 90 percentile has almost 50% more of pollinators than the 10 percentile in this farm. So there is a lot of heterogeneity in the world in terms of how much the harvest, despite it's the same crop under the same climate, under the same soils. And these, these farms, there is a lot of also of heterogeneity in pollinator abundance. So the next step is to understand if these two things are linked. So if the farms with more pollinators, they have greater yields. Uh, so how much pollinator deficit contribute to yield gap? And we found that pollinator deficits were really important. 
and because we follow the same protocol everywhere in the, in the world, and this is very important, we can put actual numbers to this. So we can say, and this is a, a, an important applied tool that we can provide to, to farmers. So we can say how many flower visitors are few and how many flower visitors are enough or are abundant for, for a certain amount of crop yield. So on average in the different crops, so the 90 percentile is 5.5 flower visitors in 100 flowers and the 10 percentile is 2.5 flower visitors in 100 flowers. So if you move from here to here, you can reduce yield gap on average by 25%. 25% is a lot if you think how much uh, breeding companies work hard to increase yield potential by 2%, 1%, 3%, 5%. So we are trying to stretch a lot uh, into genetics and to increase a potential crop yield, but uh, in ecological terms, you can do a lot <laughs> and you can increase or you can reduce yield gap by 25% for different crops. Of course, this is kind of an average. For some crops, it's going to be more than 25%, and for other crops, it's going to be less. Uh, uh, this is a short summary of the study. So we can provide also predictions in more localized way for each of the crops. Uh, importantly, we have found that this was true for small holdings and large holdings, but we found that, again, biodiversity was critically, especially in large holdings. So, so again, uh, the results were very similar to the other study about the honeybees. We have found that uh, in large holdings, if you have many pollinators but only of one species, it's not enough. You need always biodiversity to ensure good pro crop pollination and good crop yield. Another aspect important of this study is that we measure crop yield at the farm level. So actually this is the, the harvest that the farmers obtain. So this is a real agricultural knowledge and uh, with a direct impact for farmers' livelihood. So <clears throat> why is that we are finding so, such important signals all over the world? Because this, despite that we, uh, we apply the same protocol, this is kind of mm, a data with a lot of noise because you have different regions and different crops, different techniques, uh, agricultural techniques, but we, the signal of the pollination deficit is very clear all over the world. So there is a, <clears throat> a lack of pollinators all over the world and we are seeing this in a very clear way. And this is also relative in the, in the way that we are doing agriculture. So, Conventional intensification is the perfect receipt for pollination deficit because on the one side we are increasing the demand of pollination. Why we are increasing the demand of pollination? Because we had these huge uh, monocultures that they flower during very short periods in a very intensive way. So during two weeks, for example, we need tons and tons of pollinators. But at the same time, this way of doing agriculture is destroying pollinator diversity and pollinator abundance. So there is no offer of the service. So demand is increasing, but offer is decreasing. So we have a deficit as a result. Uh, so we have seen that uh, ecological intensification through pollinator-friendly practices is a way that could uh, alleviate such a pollination deficit. And it's a way also to cope, in part, of course, there is no one magic solution with this challenge because it could be uh, sustainable, it 
can reduce yield gap and is useful where it's most needed, that is small holdings in different places in the world. <clears throat> so another issue is that uh, <clears throat> crop yield not only depends on pollinators, but they also depend on pest regulation and natural cycling. So we wanted to understand the interactions about these different ecosystem services and different that are being provided by different organisms. So we test uh, through meta-analysis if there were a, an interaction between these different services and here it is exemplified with pest regulation and pollination. So if you focus on this line only, you have, if you increase pest regulation, you're going to obtain more crop yield. And the red line is with more pollination. So if you increase pest regulation, but under better pollination, you're going to obtain even more crop yield per unit of pest regulation. So this is a positive interaction. Here you have the opposite, it's a negative interruption, and here you have additive in effects, so no interaction. So we did some meta-analysis to understand which were the common patterns, or which of these patterns were the most common. And we have found only 16 studies uh, analyzing 22 ways interactions. So this is kind of a, a new area of research of these studies. 15 were published after uh, 2010, so this is all new studies that they have less than 10 years old. And the third thing is that we found that multiple services limit crop yield simultaneously. So no matter how much pest regulation you have, if you increase pollination, you're going to obtain more yield. And the same for pollination, no matter how pollination you have, if you increase pest regulation, you're going to increase crop yield. So there is a simultaneous a limitation of crop yield. And we have found that the most common pattern is this one of additive effects. The same result that we have found with honeybees and, and wild insects. And the second most common pattern was the synergistic effect. And we found no evidence for negative interaction in any of these studies. And, but as I say, this is a new area of research most of these studies analyze only two levels of the ecosystem service delivery. For example, no pest regulation versus high pest regulation, but they do not create a gradient of pest regulation. And the same with pollination. They study, for example, uh, less pollination in contrast with more pollination, but they do not create a gradient of pollination. So actually, we know very little about the functional form of how crop yield react with these ecosystem services. And from a management point of view, in terms of marginal returns and economic uh, analysis, farmer profits, trying to understand these functional forms is very important. And we are still uh, far away from that kind of knowledge. So another action or policy is to try to incorporate into decisions the long term. Most of our farming decisions are only based in short-term analysis. But if we consider the long-term, our decisions in terms of how we use life, the land might change in important ways. And this is a, a result from Rufus Isaac Lab here in the US. These are blueberries. Um, they did a study for four years in which they compared farms with uh, these uh, grasslands or uh, these um, <coughs> uh, flower strips that were sown exclusively for pollinators with the uh, farms that did not have this uh, practice. And you can see here that, again, uh, this uh, pollinator-friendly practice is based on a diversity of different native species that try to provide 
different resources for pollinators and they did this for four years and they um, did a economic analysis so taking into account also the opportunity cost so the they took into account the not only the direct cost of buying the seeds, doing the, this, implementing this practice, but also the amount of blueberry harvest that you lose here for not having blueberries. And they have seen that during the first year, the farmers that implemented this practice, they lose a lot of money because they had to spend in buying the seeds and implementing the practice. And they have the same or similar yield than the farmers that did not implement this practice. And that was the situation during the first three years, but they have seen that year after year, the crop yield was increasing in these uh, farms with the pollinator friendly practice. And at the fourth year, uh, the farmers that implemented these practices, they had a uh, profit much higher that the farmers that did not implement and those profits covered the losses of the previous three years. So this is a practice that is paid by itself because of the higher yield that was obtained from implementing the practice. So it's, a, it's an agricultural practice that uh, the farmers benefit from implementing it without uh, the necessity of any subsidies or any other incentives, uh, but it was only evident after four years of research. And uh, all over the world, there, there are very few studies, less than five, I think, that are uh, <coughs> providing this kind of data over the long term. So this is a very uh, important knowledge and it's a knowledge gap that we should consider. <coughs> Another important aspect is the uh, stability in crop yield. So this is a, a functional form that I have been showing you all over my talk, using pollen as an example of a result, resource affecting crop yield. <clears throat> but you can see, you can think uh, as an example as with precipitation. So here, is the, you can think of as the average precipitation of a region. So this should be the yield that you obtain with the average precipitation, say, for example, 800 millimeters. This is the yield that you obtain a year with 100 millimeter less, say 700 millimeters, so you obtain less yield. And this is the yield that you obtain with a year with higher precipitation than the average, say 900 millimeters. So this is 100, this is 100, but you can see here that the effect of 100 millimeter less is much higher than the effect of 100 millimeters more. Uh, and so when you go to this region, and you measure crop yield through the years and you do an average, the crop yield through the years is not going to be this crop yield. That is the one that you obtain from the average precipitation of that place. It's going to be lower because the bad year had a higher influence than the good year. And this is very critical knowledge in terms of farming systems, especially in uh, cycles of precipitation that we have. But we test this idea using pollen as an example of a resource affecting crop yield. And so the idea is that when you have a deficit, because the deficit is not going to affect only the variability in crop yield, of course it's going to affect it, but it's also going to affect the mean in crop yield. And the, the variability in pollen is not also going to affect the variability in yield, but the variability in pollen is also going to affect the mean crop yield. So the idea is that uh, crops with uh, 
a higher degree of pollinator dependency will have a lower stability in crop yield over the years. And we tested this with the data for the last five decades. And from left to right, you have increasing degree of pollinator dependency. So you have cereals here that they are not pollinator dependent. And here you have cocorbits or uh, <coughs> cocoa or almonds, etc. And you can see that the results are very clear. When you increase pollinator dependence, uh, the variability in crop yield increases. So this idea of, and this impact uh, very importantly for in terms of farmers profits and in terms of crop production. So one means that the production of this year was the same to the previous year. Values above one, it means that the production of this year was higher than the previous year. And values be below one, it means that the production of this year was lower than the previous year. <clears throat> so it's important also to incorporate a, a long-term perspective in management decision. And in general, when you incorporate this, a environmental friendly practices, they gain value and they, they, they usually uh, they, they have a higher priority. And the last issue I wanted to discuss with you is to incorporate also multiple dimensions. So, so far I have been talking only about crop yield and only about agriculture, but these pollinator friendly practices, they also impact other aspects of a farming landscape that are important for societies. So, and they, they have many synergies. So, for example, <clears throat> uh, the same practices that you apply to benefit uh, wild pollinator diversity, they also provide important resources for honeybee health and they, provide, they also enhance a beekeeping industry that is very important, especially in many developing countries, they, uh, as a source of income for uh, smallholders or families with low to middle income. And especially in many developed countries, also beekeeping industry is very important in terms of economic reasons, in terms of cultural reasons. And um, uh, this is very critical also here in the US where we are seeing during the last decades, a huge crisis in the beekeeping industry uh, associated to economic problems, but also to environmental problems. Uh, so the idea is to think in this uh, multifunctional landscape. And there are uh, studies <coughs> showing that these practices, they also provide synergies in terms of preventing soil erosion, preventing water contamination, enhancing pest control, enhancing biodiversity in general, and many benefits of biodiversity like scenic value and tourism. Of course, there are also trade-offs, as I mentioned before, like opportunity costs, because if you're going to preserve a, an area of a native forest within an agricultural landscape, that is a, an area that is not being used with crops, so you are not obtaining a harvest from there. So the idea is to start doing these practices in the places with the trade-off are lower and the synergies are higher. For example, if you have a farm, uh, you, your land is not going to be homogeneous, so there is some heterogeneity. And you know that some pieces of your farm are high yielding and other pieces of your farm are low yielding. So if, if you start doing these practices in the low yielding part, you will have less trade-offs. And some of these parts, for example, low yielding par parts of your farm might be close to water sources because they get flood. And so that enhances the synergies because if you conserve natural areas there, you are also providing better fil filtration of the chemicals. So you have less chemical into a creek, into a water, that we consume, less erosion, less soil coming into the water, less flooding in general. 
in many agricultural places we are having huge problems with floodings because of the way that we are doing agriculture. Uh, so marginal lands close to water sources might be places where trade-offs are lower and synergies are higher and it's a good way to, to start implementing these practices to obtain benefits not only in, high, in terms of higher crop yield but also other benefits. So we, in this aspect of multifunctional landscape, we, we tried to understand which was the knowledge uh, in terms of how this uh, uh, environmentally friendly landscape benefit not only crop yield but other aspects that are important for human well-being and we found that there is almost no data. So, uh, so in this comparison in terms of conventional farming versus environmental friendly farming, w conventional farming is dominated but it, this is this is a land use that is not based into scientific evidence in terms of other benefit that conventional agriculture provides us in terms of social aspect of cultural aspect because we found mostly that there is no socioeconomic evidence that uh, compares conventional farming with uh, environmental friendly farming and of course it's less evidence in the long terms so when you go and look the social and economic evidence. Uh, most evidence is related to crop yields and profits and what we see is actually it's opposite to what many people thought is that many environmental friendly practices they provide higher crop yields and they provide higher profits. But many of these profits and crop yield of course is per hectare and uh, associated to farming systems that sometimes they are not so friendly for large-scale farming. So it, it's interesting that uh, actually these systems are more product and they provide more profit per hectare. Um, so to try to cope with this knowledge gap we develop with United Nations different protocols to try to uh, measure the multiple dimensions of value of environmental friendly uh, farming and to quantify these impacts and we apply this protocol in different places in the world in Africa and especially also in, in Brazil and the idea is that economy is not only market and value goes beyond price uh, so the idea is to quantify the multiple dimensions of value in terms of social, human, cultural, financial, environmental and physical aspects and more. For example, uh, the value of, if you focus only on beekeeping, the value that uh, pollinator friendly practices have in terms of the beekeepers associations, the employment that they provide in beekeeping, the traditional and identity, the sales of honeys and the income from crop pollination, the promotion of biodiversity in general and the physical stocks of honeybee colonies. Um, so in our group we are also working <clears throat> in different aspects of uh, human and social aspect and we are trying to understand how for example a more environmental friendly landscape like those high in high crop diversity provide more agricultural shops and how that can benefit the economy in general. So the idea is that uh, bees and pollinators in general are a, a, a case study or an example of environmental friendly uh, landscape in general and bee friendly landscape are human friendly landscape in general in multiple dimensions. So thank you.